welcome to the Institute of World Politics. For those who are new, IWP is a graduate school of national security, intelligence, and international affairs. Uh, we offer a doctoral program, seven master's degree programs, including two online MAs, and 18 certificates of graduate study. If you are interested in learning more about us, please feel free to speak to one of our staff at the conclusion of this event, or visit iwp.edu. Uh, to support the work of IWP, uh, please visit iwp.edu slash donate. Uh, today, we will be hearing from Mr. Kelly Ogle and Dr. And Dr. Sarah Bakshuri, uh, who are discussing the Russia-Ukraine war and global energy security. Mr. Ogle is the Chief Executive Officer of the Canadian Global Affairs Institute. Among being an entrepreneur, scholar, and published author, Mr. Ogle manages the Energy Security Forum, and host Energy Security Cube, a weekly podcast discussing all facets of energy security. He has held positions as a board member of several companies, public, private, and nonprofit, such as the board of the Humboldt Broncos Hockey Club. Mr. Ogle received a Bachelor of Arts degree from the University of Saskatchewan, a Master of Strategic Studies from the University of Calgary, and holds the ICD.D designation from the Institute of Canadian Directors. Dr. Vakshuri is the founder and president of SDB Energy International, a strategic energy consulting firm with offices in Washington, D.C. and Dubai. She is also an adjunct professor of energy security at the Institute of World Politics. And Dr. Vakshuri has about two decades of experience of working in the energy industry with extensive experience in global energy market studies, energy security, and geopolitical risk and she has consulted numerous public and private sector energy and policy leaders. Welcome, Mr. Ogle and Dr. Baxter. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to, um, to be here today and uh, also to have Kelly all the way from Canada here. Uh, he is one of uh, the most prominent scholars in the field of energy that I know, one of the realists uh, realist in this field. Uh, who understands uh, not only the um, the knowledge and theories and uh, ideologies, uh, but also have been work, uh, working in this field for a long time and has a hands-on knowledge on um, most of the important issues in the uh, energy security. We are here today uh, at a time that um, we are kind of late we lived with no really options when it comes to energy crisis. Uh, globally, everybody has kind of acknowledged that we are in, uh, in an energy crisis today. Uh, many blaming Russia and the Russian-Ukrainian war uh, for this crisis, but if we look at it in a more extensive way, it has started even before the war breaks, uh, after the pandemic, when uh, the supply could not catch up with the demand growth. We had demand uh, growing steadily and healthy since the vaccination started happening around the world, but due to lack of investment, particularly in fossil fuel, the supply could not catch up uh, with the rise of demand. And then we started having high prices even before the war was announced and uh, broke. We had, we start having fertilizer issue, which now today many are talking about it, even before the war breaks. In the Europe, because of high gas prices, many fertilizing companies and factories have started reducing their production. So many of those indications of the crisis that we are now in, in the midst of that have started by second half of, and toward the end of last year, even before the war breaks. And just war exacerbates the effect of that globally. We are having a lot of topics, Kelly, to cover. Uh, it's uh, not only the oil prices, but also the crisis of petroleum products. We are in the United States. We are heading into a driving season in the US. Uh, summer, people drive more. Uh, the issue is not the supply of crude oil, but the refinery capacity, about 30% <coughs> of East Coast uh, unfinished gasoline and gasoline supplies was coming from Russia. 
And when a U.S. Uh, voluntarily stopped and ceased the import of Russian uh, gasoline and products to U.S., we had a surge of prices, which are very hard to compensate because because of ESG issues, a lot of that U.S. domestic uh, refinery petroleum products capacity was shut down. Uh, there are issues with Canada. We are not importing as much as we could oil from Canada. The investment inside of our own country has had hiccups. Uh, the shale companies did not respond as they used to do uh, to the high prices. Uh, and they are not producing as fast as they used to produce uh, previously. So there are a lot of different topics to uh, cover. And then talking about the nexus of water and uh, energy, energy and food, the fertilizer issues, and now that the world is talking about the challenges like food security, uh, perhaps sometimes by next year. So we are so fortunate to have you, Kelly, here. Uh, Kelly uh, is one of the very unique scholars in this field that looks at different aspects and different angles of energy security and puts everything uh, in a perspective for us in one direction to look at it. So I won't um, uh, take more time and um, look forward to hearing from you. Thanks, Sarah, and, and thanks to IWP for uh, this opportunity to uh, talk to you. Um, I'm here uh, actually for tomorrow, uh, all day workshop at the National Press Club about North American energy uh, security and the uh, uh, and Canadian oil production. Um, I'm just going to pop out a couple of things first. In the mid-80s, the world production of hydrocarbons produced about 80% of total energy demand in the world. And oil production was about 40 million barrels a day. Today, oil production is 80 or 100. I just gave you 100 million barrels per day, roughly. And do you know how much percentage of the total energy demand comes from hydrocarbons? 80 percent. Same as it was 40 years ago. So just that sort of frames the the whole discussion from my perspective. I just want you to think about that because um, it it feeds into. Uh, uh, most of what I'm going to say. So first of all, a little bit about the Institute, the Canadian Global Affairs Institute, and sorry, I have to follow these notes or we'll be here all afternoon because I'll be digressing into some other conversation because it's just what I do. Um, and I'm very passionate about what I do and uh, I'm looking forward to, to, to telling you a few things about us, Canada, my views about some of the world security, energy security issues and uh, look forward to questions if I can answer them. Um, we are an unbiased, nonpartisan think tank. Our mesh mission is to identify Canadian global interests and promote uh, active and effective international involvement through rigorous strategic and policy analysis from a Canadian perspective. Inside the Canadian Global Affairs Institute, I have the Energy Security Forum, where some of our fellow staff and other commentators discuss the increasingly salient and timely issues around global energy security. Um, as everyone in this room knows, being all first worlders here, efficient, reliable energy is an absolute necessity for modern life. It's hard to imagine living without electricity, light, or heat, as all, although lots of people in the world do. In developed countries, we've made energy so convenient and accessible that we have forgotten how much work it is to get it that way. Energy security isn't important until it is. And that, in, in, in most of my lifetime, it's been fairly easy to have access to all the energy you need. It's also very global. Flows of oil, gas, coal, uranium, electricity have become fungible and almost, you know, interdependent um, for good and, and uh, bad. Um, sometimes that's not good as we're seeing with, with the uh, crisis in Eastern Europe. Um, also, the future of batteries, metals, copper, cobalt, iron ore, all these things factor into the future of energy security, and security itself writ large. Um, I define, we, the Canadian the Energy Security Forum, defines energy security as, quote, the provision of reliable supplies of energy at an affordable price through economically and environmentally sustainable energy systems. The first two parts of that are fairly easy to understand. In the last decade, ESG, uh, environment, society, governance have taken a very 
a much more active role in the future of energy and, and therefore have greatly influenced how energy security is viewed. A bit about Canada. Um, as most of you, I hope, would know, Canada is a huge energy export exporter and we're blessed and cursed by being uh, on the continent with the U.S., the world's largest consumer of oil and natural gas. Our energy uh, infrastructure is almost entirely directed to the United States. You know, Canada and the United States, almost all commodities trade on a north-south basis, and energy is of certainly of no, uh, is no different than that. And this has led to a deeply consequential relationship with the United States and has reduced uh, Canada's influence in the global energy system. We are, uh, our ability to play a role as a reliable source of energy in some of the most important energy security parts of the world are not there, uh, certainly mostly because of infrastructure, and I can get into uh, most of the, more of that. Um, however, in the near future, the Trans Mountain Pipeline from northern Alberta to Vancouver will be in service, I think in 2024, um, and that takes about 600,000 barrels a day of crude oil from Alberta to global markets, of which a lot of that market is destined for Southern California and refineries in the United States. But it also, but it now all of a sudden, we're not a landlocked oil oil, oil distributor anymore. We uh, and the market um, in Asia and uh, uh, Eastern Asia and the Far East should be available to Canada, given price and, and uh, supply constraints. Secondly, uh, under construction is the uh, gasoline pipeline and LNG Canada project in uh, northern British Columbia to provide uh, LNG to the world, um, almost 14 million tons uh, per annum of Canadian LNG destined for Asia. And I'll just mention that that LNG will be the cleanest LNG in the world because all of the electricity, electricity derived to produce the LNG comes from hydro. Um, the current state of the global energy crisis, it is, there's no question. Um, the Russian invasion of the Ukraine is, and sorry folks, I just got to stay on the script and I'll get off on a tangent. The invasion of the Ukraine has changed everything when it comes to uh, energy security, uh, but part of why it's so impactful is due to the global trends which have reduced the resiliency of our energy systems. Um, nevertheless, I'll start with the invasion, more importantly, in response to the invasion. Uh, according to Bloomberg, the Biden administration believed that it, it's excluding food and energy would limit the inflationary impact of the sanctions. Um, there were two errors to that, in my opinion. They underestimated the impact of firm self-sanctioning. And second, they misunderstood the deep interdependence of energy with every other part of the economy. Despite the explicit inclusion of energy from the first round of sanctions, Western energy firms often went above and beyond the scope of the sanctions. For example, Shell announced its withdrawal from all Russian hydrocarbons on March 8th, long before Europe came close to a political agreement on facing out Russian oil. Um, and and uh, one of uh, the country chair of Shell is one of our advisors. They're still trying to get some of their people on Russia. But that the large major independent uh, International oil and gas companies that operated in north, northern, especially in Siberia and northern Russia, with them leaving, this will have a, certainly have a long-term effect on Russian oil and gas in, uh, in the future as the as the hopefully the crisis comes to an end. Um, the effect of this self-sanctioning could be seen in the steep discount of Russian Urals crude versus Brent, which is uh, reference price. Prior to the war, the discount hovered around fifty cents to three dollars a barrel. This exploded after the with a discount of more than thirty-five dollars per barrel. This this stigma around buying Russian crude oil became so intense enough that Kazakhstan rebranded its oil uh, to avoid confusion with Russia. Why did firms self-sanction? A lack of guidance from sanctioning authorities and ESG. Simply that. According to Justine Walker from the Association of Certified Anti-Money Laundering Specialists, that's a mouthful. Governments reportedly told companies that they would need to make their own decision on whether to sanction certain entities, leading companies to be extremely risk averse. You can, you can understand that. But uh, as Sarah mentioned, um, ESG pressures have played a role in, the, in this case, the emphasis on the social rather than the environment or governance. Uh, with Shell's decision to pull out of Russia followed public condemnation as they bought a load of crude oil uh, on the ocean, 
during the time of the, uh, like on the spot market, shortly after the, the, uh, the uh, invasion started. Um, sanctions on other industries will affect energy as well. In a March 23 survey for the Dallas Fed, the exploration production firms pointed out that the largest cost increases over the previous 12 months was tubular steel. Oil and gas service firms confirmed this assessment, saying that lead times on oil and gas pipe products could happen the whole industry. And I can speak from uh, experience, as I'm, I, I'm deeply involved with lots of the oil and gas producers in Calgary. And if you don't have your pipe, your pipe ready for, uh, if you don't have your pipe purchased today for the 2022-23 building season, you won't get it. So there's a there's a definite there's friction and uh, consequence of of, uh, of that coming to the to the uh, fore as Russia is the fifth largest steel producer in the world. Steel price cruise, steel prices have come down um, since the UN ban on Russian steel imports um, and U.S. sanctions on steel manufacturer Severstal. But the destruction of the Azovstal iron and steel works, I apologize for, the, for butchering that, um, will continue to disrupt American oil and gas production for some time because there's just, the, the, these were large, large steel producers. Um, the interesting uh, anecdote here about the last week when Gazprom uh, decided to limit natural gas flows through the Nord Stream 1 pipeline to 67 million cubic meters per day, which is only 40% of its capacity. There's lots of debate about the reason for this cut. It could be well meant to prevent European countries from refilling their natural gas storage levels, which was more and more news about this in, in the recent uh, days uh, because of a fear of a cold winter, um, and also maybe taking advantage of the explosion of the Freeport LNG plant uh, export terminal in, in uh, Texas, which will be shut down now, I understand, well through the fall. Um, but from a Canadian perspective, it's Siemens Energy states that Canadian sanctions prevented Siemens from returning gas turbines required for the pipelines pump stations. These turbines receive regular maintenance in Montreal. And this, it, it, this could be a simply convenient excuse, but it demonstrates another possible avenue of sanctions on manufacturers good, manufactured goods to unexpected effect, unexpectedly affect energy security elsewhere in the world. This isn't to say that Western countries shouldn't put sanctions in place. I, 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 that's, I, that's another debate. But the sanctions should have been approached with the assumption that they would increase prices. That's the plan. You know, that's generally the plan. Um, but to make a comparison, Russia today is not Iran in 2018. Russia's economy is different from Iran, so it's large, being larger and more heavily integrated with the rest of the world. And 2022 is different than 2018 because of the direction of global trends as well as the destruction of gold. Europeans, Europe's natural gas production has been in decline for years and expected to suffer further declines in the future. Before the invasion of the Ukraine, it was accepted that these declines would not be offset by energy transition policies, meaning that Europe would be more and more dependent on Russian gas, even as their economies in general moved away from the fuel. So it seemed counterintuitive, but that's what the, the uh, policies of the European Union have done in the past several years. You know, renewable energy and electrification are changing the dynamics of energy security around the world, and I don't dispute that. There's a desperate need for the technologies to manage intermittency and transmission to connect electric supplies with demand. Remember, that there's a lot more to the energy security paradigms than just electricity. And uh, uh, until, until now, renewables have benefited from legacy infrastructure, infrastructure, but they'll face growing pains in uh, modernizing and multiplying the size of electrical grid. I think that this is maybe one of the largest, not only misunderstood, but, but uh, hardest uh, nuts to crack in the future of energy security is, is the uh, build out of electrical grids and nimbyism and the banana phenomenon that's uh, occurring in most jurisdictions in the world. However, the growth and uh, liberalization of LNG markets is another trend. Many develop, develop, developing countries have entered the market for LNG, competing with strong sources of demand in Europe and Asia. And supplies, meanwhile, have had difficulty, difficulty catching up and are often beset by maintenance issues and severe weather events such as hurricanes. 
Um, Russia is also a major player in global LNG, providing 20% of the EU's LNG imports in 2021, forming a significant chunk of expected additional LNG supply. Just a little tidbit, um, and Ru Russia has 17 ice-breaking LNG carriers. 17. I don't know that there are any more of those in the world. So they can find markets in other parts of the world with their LNG if, the, if there's buyers. I'll just leave it at that. I think that the main uh, inter, uh, energy security issue for me going forward is the fact is the, uh, the disassociation between investment and supply. Um, investment in oil, natural gas, and coal production has fallen sharply. Among OPEC countries, Angola and Nigeria have consist consistently missed OPEC targets. I just read this morning where Ecuador has uh, their their production is almost shut in because of. Uh, civil strife and protests and uh, workers in the, in the Ecuadorian uh, country not producing uh, energy. Uh, Libya is almost shut in. Um, and as Sarah mentioned, the United States, which formed the bulk of additional production in the 2010s, investors are not, are not willing to put cap the necessary cash needed to bring another dramatic expansion in production after being burnt by, by themselves. Uh, to a significant fact, by the oil glut of 2014 to 2018. Inflation has made production increases more expensive, ergo the cost of steel, etc. Uh, and for coal, both China and India have begun to wrap up production to meet domestic energy needs after being shocked by an export ban from Indonesia in January and persistent high coal prices. The, the required investment in hydrocarbon, mostly oil, to maintain 100 million barrels per day is half a, bill, half a trillion dollars per year. That's just a state level. The current investment in the global energy system for hydrocarbons is about 320 billion. So that's 180, that's a 36% uh, shortfall of capital required to keep energy production, to keep oil production flat uh, in the next, uh, in the years to come. Um, and layered over everything is the uh, uncertainty caused by the pandemic and the energy transition. There was very little understanding of what the world would look like post-pandemic. And some believe in a roaring 20s of breakneck economic growth. Others believe that energy consumption had peaked in 2019 and would steadily fall. In the heady days of early 2021, not many believed that doing both was possible. It's not. For at least the next decade, we're likely to reduce demand for oil, natural gas, and coal through new energy technologies. Supply and demand will more likely be balanced with demand destruction. And it, it's a, a bugbear of mine is, is, uh, is, is the requirement of security of demand. Qatar could probably expect, could probably produce 25 to 30 percent of, of LNG and natural gas necess necessary for Europe. They want long term contracts. And, uh, you know, it's common knowledge here now in the United States that. You know, the Secretary Granholm in the last few days said, you guys need to put your oil back on production. But by the way, three or four years from now, we don't want it anymore. Well, I don't think that's going to work. Um, call me crazy. Um, the, there is demand destruction happening, but unfortunately, it's in places like Sri Lanka and Pakistan. And uh, the extreme measures needed to reduce energy demand are, are a folly. Fuel support shortages have spread across Africa. And Sarah can certainly speak a lot more about Africa than me, but we can certainly have a discussion about this. And as I just said, pro uh, protests are erupting in South America over high gasoline prices. Throw in the election in France where Marie Le Marine Le Pen returned a, a couple of scores of seats, contrary to South America and Colombia, where we just elected the leftist president. There's a lot of geopolitical tension here that is uh, that can play uh, dramatic roles in the future of energy security. Um, I just want to finish up with a bit of discussion about Canada, again, about Canada, because this is my opportunity to be in, in the, inside the uh, Beltway to talk about Canadian energy. Um, Canadian crude oil export meets, meets demand, makes up a lot of demand in the Midwestern United States through a growing share. Uh, some oil is directed to the Gulf Coast, where it can be exported either as crude oil or refined products. However, with the release of uh, how many million barrels from the SDR? 45 million, barrel, million barrels a day for the next month and a half. That oil is better suited to 
refiners uh, and will help gasoline prices uh, in the United States because it'll help fill refiners with the, get, with the oil they like for, for producing gasoline, diesel, fuel, and jet for the United States. However, however, it ends after a certain number of barrels. and It has hamstrung the Canadian exports a little bit because it, it's a better product for the refiners than, than the Canadian product at this time. Having said that, it speaks to the disassociation between no capital spent in refineries in the past several decades. That the refinery, the refinery uh, trains are are really in need of repair and uh, uh, upgrades. And there hasn't been a refinery built in the United States in several decades. I, I think sure. th this is a and there's and there's going to be refineries closed in the next couple of years. This is a this is a huge concern um, for Canada. Our capability for energy export is complex, and um, we needs to happen outside of. America, as I mentioned, with the uh, with the uh, uh, TMX pipeline to Vancouver, um, the LNG Canada project is, is also mostly focused on Asia. The joint venture includes Malaysia's Petronas, PetroChina, Japan's Mitsubishi, and South Korea's Kogas, along with Shell. Um, also on the East Coast, uh, oil produced production offshore in Newfoundland and these in this price band is back. There will be a, there's going to be a large uh, exploration development. In the Beta Nord and uh, White Rose projects in uh, the high North Atlantic, east of North Newfoundland, um, and in the additional LNG projects on the East Coast are gaining traction, um, including the Goldboro LNG in Nova Scotia, and actually even in Quebec with uh, with uh, Energy Saguenay. Naftogas, which is the Ukrainian national oil company, recently signed an MOU with Saguenay to uh, secure LNG supplies, any source from Canadian gas regasification. Facilities so when in, when they get to uh, oil. Um, however, I have to I just have to, have to be careful a little bit. Um, this is all complicated by the government of Canada's decarbonization policies and our uh, attempts to achieve Paris Agreement goals. The federal government has placed more restrictive emissions targets on the oil and gas sector, which will not be reached. Um, this was recently revealed by internal government analysis that effectively states that it's impossible to reach these steep production declines. The, the, the big, large producers of hydrocarbon in, in Alberta have set a goal of 30% emissions reductions by 2030, and the government said it needs to be 42%. It's not possible. Uh, and this is in direct contrast with the federal ministers. Uh, proposed for Canada to increase oil exports to the United States to exist to current up under supply. Um, the federal government has taken great uh, pride in saying that Canada will produce another 300,000 barrels per day for U.S. consumption. Well, that was already factored into the corporation's plans anyways. And um, that's about it, though, at this point in time. Just one final anecdote about that. When one of our other fellows, uh, Amrita Sen from Energy Aspects in London, met with the... Uh, the uh, U.S. administration, including Secretary Graham Holman, asked about the Keystone XL pipeline. We can talk about Keystone until, we, until it gets dark, if you'd like, because um, I feel like I know a fair lot about it. Uh, she said, no, we'd rather rail it because we're only going to use it for a short period of time. Um, I think I'd like to end it there. I've just got a few other things. I, today, uh, I read where the Kaliningrad, the small state up around, and the, the, the ambassador could certainly speak to this. I'm, Certain has been isolated by Lithuania, not allowing the railroad to go from Kaliningrad back to Russia is stopped. Uh, Kaliningrad is all, all of a sudden an island inside Europe, surrounded by NATO or new NATO partners. This is going to this is this is a large issue. Um, I talked about the Nord Stream down a third. The inconsistencies coming out of Europe. Germany has announced today that they're going to reinvent their their coal fleet. Um, Gas imports are, are down half of consumption comes from and half of uh, North European gas is from Norway or or the United United Kingdom. Nuclear is in, in is in transition. Uh, Germany can, expects to continue to to mothball and or just, uh, take out a commission all of their nuclear plants. Uh, France used to supply a lot of nuclear power to the rest of Europe. They are now in, going to be importing power from the United Kingdom in winter. Um, Wind and solar are interesting, but it doesn't 
it isn't windy or sun shining all the time. Um, and there's some mis there's a lot of misinformation about European renewables. You know, Germany states that they have the capacity to have double the uh, they could provide enough wind and solar to, to provide double their electricity needs if everything was on at once. Well, that it, historically it's been like 10 to 12 percent of the German uh, electrical supply. Um, I really feel that uh, the European Union is kind of whistling past the graveyard here um, in, a, in a number of senses, uh, especially around energy and energy security. Um, I fear for the uh, uh, European Union in the winter, if it's really harsh, they can't fill their gas, if they can't fill their gas caverns for uh, supply. And more importantly, the outward and existential threats to the rest of the world of food security and famines that could happen because of all of the things that, we, that I've discussed and that Sarah and I are pleased to discuss further, it really troubles me. Um, I will stop there. Exactly. Yeah. But yeah. Again, if I hadn't stayed on the script, I'd be halfway through my first comments about the Canadian Global Affairs Institute. Well, you cover so many interesting topics that I try to kind of categorize, and uh, we have a full room. I'm sure there, there are a lot of questions. We have our uh, online uh, participants. But before that, I'd like to kind of put your remarks in different categories because you touch upon many interesting topics. Uh, we. I have a privilege of teaching a course on energy security here, and the first topic that we discuss from with the students is that when we discuss energy security, we have to first understand from whose view. So we define the energy security from producers' view, from consumers' view, and in the in the dynamic of Russia and Europe, as much as the world and globally the world and Europe are dependent on Russia, many experts are arguing that Russia also depends on Europe as a market. But in the exercises that we had two years ago, three years ago with the students at IWP, when we were looking at energy security policy of Russia, we could start tracking and tracing Russia diversifying its dependency on Europe as a market. The power of Siberia pipeline that was exporting Russia's uh, gas directly to Europe, uh, to China, or those LNG icebreakers, that you, LNG uh, tankers that you mentioned. So Russia has been on a track to diversify its market and create that security of demand for itself. Whereas on the other side, Europe, because of decarbonization, started becoming even more dependent on Russian gas because they decommissioned most of their nuclear power plant after Fukushima. They were, the use of local domestic coal was reduced significantly. And as you said, renewables are not a complete uh, source for, or alternative to, uh, re, uh, to fossil fuels. So Russia's, uh, Europe's dependency on the other side was increasing on uh, Russia. One uh, very interesting point that was uh, argued is that is not being against the sanctions, but the art of sanctions or foreign policy. Can we put sanction on a country that is the largest producer and exporter of oil and gas? What is happening now is that Russia this year, even though that its oil production is less than last year because of sanction, but its energy revenue is higher than last year that was exporting at full capacity. Because <coughs> prices are high, even though that is ex even though with those $30 or $35 discounts per barrel. The second thing is happening is that why we're dealing with inflation in the United States, China is importing all of that $30 per barrel discount of oil. Chinese import of Russian oil has increased significantly. Um, and it's now, Russia has surpassed Saudi Arabia for, uh, as the largest exporter of oil. It's not only China, India. India's import of oil from around 40, 50 million barrels per day has increased to about 500 to 700 million barrels per day. And these are not thousands, yes, 700,000 uh, barrels per day, yes. And these are not, as you said, sanctions against Iran. When, like, President Trump's administration uh, announced the maximum pressure on Iran, even China and India were in full compliance with Iran, uh, with U.S. sanctions. So Iran could not export any discounted oil, no matter how much, to any country. But now we see that 
these countries are important. You discuss geopolitics, very interesting uh, issue, not only the, the elections you referred in Europe and the protests that are just going to uh, be more, but also something interesting that is happening is the change of oil trade flow. The OPEC producers, Saudi Arabia, Iraq, that they were traditionally exporting more oil to Asia, now they're exporting more oil to Europe, and Russia is exporting more oil to Asia. So how are these partnerships and these grand ge energy geopolitics are going to change when we are going to have this diversion of the uh, oil trade? Something interesting happening, the self-sanctions that you mentioned, Kelly, it, now we are seeing in the past two months, Iran and Venezuela that are at the same time under U.S. sanctions started exporting some limited cargoes of oil to Europe. So we see that President Biden administration either had issued some green light, which I'm not aware of, or we are not publicly aware of it, because Europe, since President Trump's maximum pressure, has not imported any oil from Iran or from Venezuela. But now we are having very limited, still very limited, but significant to understand how Europe started directly importing, even though, like, let's say, a couple of cargoes. Is this trend going to change? We are going to put sanctions on Russia, self-sanctions, but having more Iranian or Venezuelan uh, oil in the uh, market. So um, you mentioned uh, sanction, uh, Russian war and price of steel. Very important. Also, we have nickel prices that are all used in uh, EVs. Uh, the gas prices, uh, very, very important emphasize you had on investment and underinvestment, especially in the U.S. that was... Uh, exporting a lot and now we have US catching up still being behind to catch up with its production before COVID. For us here in US, comparing the natural gas prices in US with the prices in Europe that are at least 10 times more than US prices, you kind of realize the importance of kind of energy independence to our own uh, production or the integration with Canada the uh, North American energy integration, but it doesn't help when you go to investors and tell them, if you want to be patriotic, invest and produce for the next three years, but after that, we don't need you. Because the investors look at long-term routine. So um, there are so many uh, interesting uh, topics that have been uh, mentioned by you, Kelly. Thank you for touching upon all of that. And um, I open the floor for questions. I'll just make a couple yeah. of comments regarding that. If I could. Sure. Um, the best solution for high oil prices is high oil prices. You have to destroy demand uh, to, to make it to make a difference. Uh, but about the, uh, I think that I've read recently, uh, and I, I think I, I think I buy into this premise. Increase capital. More, we need more oil, and so we need more investment. Um, there's a couple of fallacies, generally misunderstandings, I've like been fallacies around U.S. oil production um, that I think most people don't understand. So you go into the Barnett Shale or in somewhere in West Texas and drill a shale well. Well, it declines 80% in the first year. Right? So it comes on, let's say, 5,000, 4,000 barrels a day. It's down to 1,000 by the end of the first year. So building a base of new production out of shale is hard. Plus, You've got all the things that have to go with that, like the supply, steel, etc. The other thing that's that it, that's going to affect global energy markets in the near in the next decade is this fallacy about uh, Saudi Arabia having spare production capacity. The, the <coughs> spare production capacity is defined as being able to produce an increased amount for ninety days in, without any, any intermittency. Saudi Arabia can't do that either. They, they just can't. The, 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 the capital required, the time required, infrastructure constraints, the fact that there are high, that the big basins are high water cut, that there is no spare capacity without larger uh, capital investment. And I, 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 I circle back to my comment about security of demand. Investors will not invest in typically, it's like a bond issue. You know, it's a, there's a long term, they want a long term return. And, it, and it necessarily in, 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 in high risk situations, the return needs to be higher. It's not seven percent. The investor wants a lot, and I understand that. This is I, I see it. I really see the future of uh, the 
hydrocarbon sector especially, in the world globally, outside of the state-owned enterprises. But the big companies, except for the large, large multinationals, but independents, last week, Carol Hamm at Continental announced that they're going to turn the company private. They're just going to return the asset to the owners. And I see this as a trend in, the, in Canada as well. So that's just a little bit of framing around energy, around the global oil market. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a very, uh, there's a lot of froth on it. So to speak. Yes, I'm glad you mentioned the spare capacity because there is a lot of what a lot of discussions on why OPEC and Saudi Arabia are not increasing production, more President Biden is potentially traveling to Saudi Arabia. But but the question is that how much they can produce? Russia is exporting seven million barrels of oil and liquid. How much can Saudi Arabia or OPEC uh, produce? How much of that oil is replaceable? But but also at the same time what you mentioned about investment and spare capacity is like how so, can we so in 19 in the when the former soviet union disintegrated around 1989 to 1982 1992 russian oil production went from 9 to 10 million barrels a day down to about 3 and it's taken 30 years to get back to where it is today so think about this in the future decade if the if if the way to crush Russia is embargoes, not sanctions, embargoes, stop it all. And there, there's discussion of this by the end of 2022 that will embargo all Russia. I have no the price of oil in the world globe today would be infinite if this happens. There has to be some other kind of solution or massive amounts of capital investment. That said, the large Finds in the world are offshore. They're in the whole deep water now. That's what's left in the world. But the big oil finds have been found. Having again, having said that, if you get oil high enough price, almost any like a lot of I don't know if people are, are, are understand what oil but what, what there's shale oil and then there's oil shale, which is the very end of the end of the that's the darkest, deepest, least recoverable. But at two hundred dollars a barrel. There's probably capital for that too. I don't want to see that. No one wants to see that. The but having said that, for 40 years, the price of crude oil has been relatively cheap for what for what it does globally for energy. Um, and I think uh, uh, I am predicting here a band in the 70 to 90 dollar per barrel range would probably allow enough capital investment to to get to keep to keep oil production where it needs to be. As we transition to other forms of energy in the next few decades, I don't discount that either. But I think the panacea—I'm I'm, I'm starting to digress here. The panacea around hydrogen and every hydrogen is the flavor of the month. I've been at several conferences in the past year, and everybody's got. There's more money for hydrogen than there is for little liver pills. Seriously, if you got a hydrogen project, you can get capital for it. Well, lots of things. First, I haven't seen one economic project yet that isn't that isn't subsidized. Green hydrogen. And I'm talking about blue yet. Now, blue hydrogen is now getting there because gas is nine dollars in MCL. You, you can make that work, and it, it's, it comes to the three components that I, we both touched on, and I think are so crucial to talk of, to when you're when you're discussing all forms of security. And, and I, I circle back to um, food security. Those three com commodities are are steel, um, ammonia, and well, agric all agricultural commodities like wheat, you know, that, that, that food security issue is a direct relationship, direct, directly related to the, the, the uh, Russian and uh, Ukrainian food supply for the, the fall, the fall and winter. So these things are, are crucial to the future of, of, the, uh, of the economy. And I, I, I fear for where we're going with this. I hate to be a, you know, chicken little, the sky is falling. But it is. <laughs> well, I like that how you divided the short term versus long term. Because if you look at where Russia is in long term, it might be a very different position than where it is today, where Europe is. So we're just looking at what is happening now. And something that is interesting is that as much as there is a discussion, polit politicians putting pressure on OPEC for producing more oil, no one addressing the lack and shortage of refinery capacity. And the only country that at this point can increase its refinery capacity is China, 
no one is really asking China or addressing the fact that before the war, during the pandemic, China put a suspension on export of its petroleum products. That suspension has not been removed yet. And if they remove that suspension, the world is going to have more products. But um, this is fascinating. We can go on well, and on. But remember that there's a cost to that because China produces, you know, they, they use up all of their own oil production, the gas production inside the country. Yeah. If, you had to, if you had to transport it there, turn it into product, take it somewhere else, that the economics fall apart. I understand they have the excess mining capacity, but I don't see economics in it. If you're transporting, them, maybe from the Middle East, you could take or you could take oil from China and turn it into products and export. But it's it's that's a there's going to be friction, as Klaus Fitz would say. And as you go along there, the the, the friction will continue and fog will continue to back up your your plan. Yeah, but they, they are still importing a lot from Middle East discounted oil. A lot of those teapot refineries that they are not producing, but... But they would use it all internally. Yes, like instead of yeah. sending instead it to other parts of the world that need it. Well, shall we open Absolutely. it? Absolutely. Yes. I, I, um, I hope I can be... I hope yeah. folks found that informative. Sure. Um, so real quick, because I'm sure there's a lot of people in here who have questions. We have people watching online. Okay. So I just wanted to jump in real quick with an online question then. Sure. Um, so Harrison wants to know, there was talk back in 2014 of building LNG terminal infrastructure in Eurasia so that U.S. exports could displace Russian. It was estimated that it would take about four to five years. Why did this never happen? I have no idea. Honestly, I have no idea. Okay. Is that the only question? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, I'm wondering about the effect of war in the Persian Gulf. A few days ago, the Arab News had an editorial um, calling for the United States to conduct a punitive air strike against Iran. And we know that President Biden is going to Saudi Arabia. So I just put that on there. Well, it's always a, you know, it's sort of the overlying existential threat, is it not? And, that, and that, I think that that's enough. The, the, uh, oh, having said that, uh, I read this morning where a couple of, there was a little bit of a dust up between a couple of Iranian ships and a couple of American uh, uh, frigates in the, in the, in the Gulf uh, in the last couple of days. So I don't think it's out of the question. I think that, the, the, in my own opinion, um, the, and I, that's why I mentioned uh, Ambassador Reminder, Calston, the country, Kalingrad. Yeah, um, could be a. It's sort of like it could be kind of like Sarajevo, in nineteen fourteen. Here, something could happen there because of of uh, what's happened with that railroad. That I think that that that, that that's a uh, simmering pot in Europe that could involve all of a sudden NATO could be involved here, and that changes the whole scope of everything about Russia and and uh, Ukraine. I, I, that's my fear more than the Persian Gulf. What the United States projects so much power. In the Gulf, I, I it would be crazy enough to 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 force some to something kinetic to happen. That's just my opinion. Yes. Uh, so two questions that are kind of interlinked. Do you think that the Russian strategy has now shifted since it's since they see that it's not a short war in Ukraine? That instead of trying to essentially take the country now, they're trying to wear down the Europeans to essentially push for a peace through both. Uh, withholding gas and uh, food to certain regions. And also, do you think that the now, I guess, um, Ukraine's now targeting uh, Russian offshore uh, oil from uh, Crimea? I saw that this morning. Like, so do you think that's going to uh, affect Russian oil so, production? So, to your first question, I would encourage everyone, if you haven't, to read the 5,000 word essay that Vladimir Putin wrote last July. Um, go find it, and uh, you'll get an understanding of his plan. Um, and I'm just going to leave it at that because I, I'm not going to paraphrase something that he wrote. And you know, be patient in it. It's been translated from Russian, so it's you know, it, it wouldn't pass. All a lot of the people in this room would have a lot. We have their red pen out a lot, but that's not the point. The point is that his plan is long, long, long term. I don't think that that crosses his mind. I think this is really a. This is an, an area where, um, you know, the, the you know the Crimea start. This is this is eight years. This has been happening, not just this war, but um, the 
I, I don't know if the, if the if if the Russians and I'm not an expert, but I don't know that they planned for that for this part of what's happening. I thought I think they felt they would be more that they would be further advanced in their advances by this time, and such that this could not have happened. But that's again my own opinion. I'm not. I think it's 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 a certainly a step in the right direction from Ukraine's perspective. Yes. Um, I was shocked by how precipitously, even recklessly, the oil companies just pulled completely out of out of Russia. What was their total losses in that? And has any of that, you know, been passed on to this price, or is it that just, you know, global competition? And uh, what what do you think a better way to do it was? I mean, it seems they should have pulled all their as much of their assets out and sold them before they. they well, it's hard to do that though. Like the fixed assets in the energy sector are are uh, you, you don't bring them with you. Um, I, I'm going to venture a guess that the write downs that will take place at the end of the second quarter here by the big companies Exxon, Shell, Chevron, those that, that operate there is going to be in the fifty billion range. I mean, fifty billion. That's just I, I can remember a couple companies at eight and another one at twelve. The bigger issue I think for the for the Russian. Oil production, because of of that, is not the energy companies. It's Halliburton, Schlumberger, the large service companies that run the businesses for Russia. That's why that happened in 1992. Is these companies left? They weren't working there anymore. And that's where the technical expertise is. Is the is with the uh, with the big service companies that that do the work, like the fracking and the workovers and the seismic and the logging of all of wells, things like that. That's the bigger issue, I think, for Russian uh, going forward. How, how to do it different? I don't think that the, the, the political will or the, the the ethical view of them as corporations had to do that with what was happening with the rest of the world's view of Russia. That's, again, my view. Uh, second question, really quick. What, uh, what's the breakdown of uh, half a trillion dollars a year uh, continue, uh, investment in in uh, the whole infrastructure to keep up. So it's not infrastructure. It's more like the, that. That's the amount of drilling, completions, and production necessary to spend spend on the upstream sector. Nothing to do with downstream. All upstream. Half a billion. Half, sorry, half a trillion globally. Oh, so you mentioned a lot of this you know, tying back to food insecurity in Crimea and, and areas like that. Is, does water play a role in any of that? Water is the most important uh, resource going forward globally. In my you have to have it after Washington. Um, and you know, the It's unregulated. I'm sorry. It's sort of a great a black box of regulation globally, and it's not shared globally. It's not shared globally. I, I think that the, the big issues in northern, like in well, Sarah, please, please speak to Africa and water. I, this is a it's a giant concern along with food security as we get drier. And please believe me, I'm not a climate denier. I'm not I, I, I believe that hydrocarbons are, are the, need to be part of. The, Go for a plan. Mitigation and um, adaptation are, the, are keys to the future of, of energy security. Um, water plays a giant role in that too. And I don't know. I, I saw today another interesting anecdote this morning. Uh, Saudi Aramco announced a giant desalination uh, project this morning um, to provide green hydrogen and uh, desalinated water. But you know, Saudi Aramco could do that. What about countries in Northeast Africa and, and Sub-Saharan that don't have that opportunity? Because um, if it if it doesn't if it doesn't fit the national interests of China, they won't invest. It's uh, it's a huge concern, huge concern. I think it's very underappreciated the, the, the future of water security, especially the nexus of water and energy. That you need energy to make that water desal that water and make it drink. Or clean it. Or clean it, treat it. Yeah. That's, that's the most issue, like the health issue. It's that really 
health crisis in areas that you mentioned, like in Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa. And uh, again, you mentioned China. It's scary that how much China invests in Africa because of owning those mines, because of controlling the assets. But we don't see much on U.S. or U.S. investment. Before your question, I just have I want to have I want to put a layer of optimism on on this because in that build out of the new energy system, all these critical minerals are necessary. China has, you know, most of the rare earths, and then we can get into a discussion about the belt in Congo. But my feeling is that God didn't put all those things in Congo or China. Canada, if you understand our geography and, ge and geology, has about a two about a third of Canada's total land mass is the Canadian Shield, from Hudson Bay across to the Yukon, all the way north. It's all rock. There's got to be some of that stuff in there, <laughs> and it's an it's an opportunity for Canadian industry, Canadian resource companies, the Canadian Canada writ large, to further truth and reconciliation with Indigenous peoples because that's who live there, and opportunities for investment and and uh, large scale. Uh, I think large scale rare earth developments will happen in Canada. There's certain amounts in the United States as well, but and uh, but Canada is a, is a treasure trove. One more, one more point. We did because we never got to it. I want to talk about uh, uh, nuclear power a bit because it, it, it certainly is a reflection of Russia. Going back to all that discussion about electricity, none of the goal, aspirational goals of Western governments in the, in the bowing to the climate doctrine are achievable without nuclear power. They're just not. Yes, we're forty percent of the world's uh, refined uranium comes from Russia. Canada, the United States, other countries supply a lot of uranium, but 40% of it, not enriched, but uh, refined uranium is done in Russia. This is actually a very concern for geopolitics in that as the world is moving towards energy transition and nuclear power generation is going to uh, increase and expand, it's the club of Russia China club that is much more. Uh, Influ has influence and market in terms of expanding the nuclear technology and also the fuel, fueling those uh, power generations. Um, looking at countries like Namibia that has huge sources of uranium, China has control over most of the mines and then Russia trying to get there. I know that Canada is good in mining and they're in gold mines and different mines in Africa, but uh, there is a real concern that China and Russia are really having that dominance in expanding the nuclear power generation in, around the world, but US and European, like France, they are much more regulated and less, uh, at least say, interested in having that active role. Yeah, there was, a, yes, you had a question? Yeah. Sir? Okay. Uh, what do you expect will be happening in the energy relations between Canada and the U.S.? Uh, you know, I like that question because I could go on for hours about that. Um, I've been a, uh, if you read things that I've written, not that you should, but if you did, um, I've talked about North American energy security for a decade. And um, we are, United, when the United States talks about energy independence, it includes Canadian oil production. Has to. You use 19 million barrels a day, you produce 11. Where does it, the rest of it come from? Most, a lot of, the, of that, that net zero of energy security is, comes from Canada and Mexico. I think there's a giant opportunity if, if policymakers could align. We're very integrated, especially on the gas systems. Like Canadian natural gas is being shipped as LNG to Europe because the systems are integrated. And, and we buy a lot, a lot of Canadian natural gas that's used for heating in, uh, in Ontario comes from Pennsylvania. So there, there's a, it's, a, it's a bird's nest on the ground here, really. But policymakers, um, I, sorry, but the last decade has seen such a move toward green solutions that I think they've left behind some of the, the uh, economies of scale that, are, that could be could, could be maintained with Canada-U.S. energy relations. And that's kind of why we're here tomorrow with a large, couple of large um, Canadian uh, production companies to talk about more about an integrated energy system. So I, I, I'm, I'm, I, I'm, I'm positive and optimistic about that. I think that the, the, the rubber meets the road literally here in, this, in that discussion. Yeah. I'd like to say my students' question for the last time.
always proud to see <laughs> my students asking questions. Me, I'm yeah. a student. Uh, I, I had two questions. Uh, my first one is, uh, I've got uh, uh, four roommates back on campus. Uh, three of them are environmental science majors, one of them is an environmental ethics major. Uh, I think that I have very disappointing news for them. Uh, what is what is the most optimistic thing I could I could tell them? <laughs> it's well, let's get pessimistic first. Okay. It's going to cost a lot, a lot. Like the the transition to net zero is the cost is exponentially. It's almost infinite if you were to. If, 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 if it would happen. Since the 1987, started by a Canadian in Rio, I think, uh, more strong, first conference of the parties. Canada, Canada has set nine goals and missed every one and continues to miss them. Paris was the last one. Um, I, I don't think there's any, I think that, that uh, the most optimistic thing I could offer would be to be realistic. Let's look at the system reali realistically and understand that technology and research can take us to places that we that we need to get to because there will be an energy transition. I just don't think it's going to happen as quickly as, as that, sorry to say, that evangelical push by uh, those that want it so bad in the in a shorter period of time, it's just not possible. And but keep doing what they're doing. Absolutely, that's the the uh, the uh, uh, the solution is to keep try, turning over new ideas. I just want to say one last thing, and I I look around this room, and it, the match is not bad. There's quite a few of you in here, but the best solution to all of these issues, in my opinion, I say this, I end my conversations all the time. From a global perspective, is to empower women globally. That's the biggest solution: is empowering more women, in, especially in developing countries. And I, it's nice to see that it isn't. A lot of these things that I attend are way. The ratio is way less than it is in here, which isn't too bad. And I, I, I like to say that um, you know the 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 future of the of, the, of all systems. It's more dependent on us having a better ratio of that. So, okay. well, we are president is a woman, and we have a lot of uh, both now today and uh, women students. But as you said, we need more women. Uh, uh, women's brain function differently; well, they contribute more uh, different. Last time I checked, they were fifty percent as well. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, we need to have fifty percent. That's right. But I'd like to add one point on energy transition that uh, we were talking about. I very much agree with you that uh, the way that uh, that the rapid ideology way that we, like some of the leaders are hoping might not happen, but. Something that I think, um, there are so many discussions that the Ukraine-Russia war and the current energy crisis, is it going to speed up the energy transition or reduce its speed? And what I think is going to happen, we're going to have a more pragmatic and smart energy transition because now the leaders have felt the pain of uh, the impact of energy crisis on their national security. and. Obviously, there's going to be a move toward energy transitions, uh, different technologies, more diverse sources of energy instead of depending on one or two, but uh, but a smarter way, just like having that diverse basket that somehow fits into every country's national security. But there are challenges too. You mentioned Africa. Uh, there's less money in the pockets of governments now to um, help and to send those to emerging markets, especially. The energy access, affordable energy, uh, how much energy transition you mentioned it's going to cost. And uh, these are all a lot of uh, questions that we can discuss in the class or in the events, but we have to wait and see how things would really work out. Well, I hope, I hope if nothing else, we have attained you. Um, there's a lot, this is a large, as they say, as the, a common predictable today, there's a lot to unpack here. And, uh, um, I look forward to further dialogue with Sarah, who is one of our fellows, by the way, at the Canadian Global Trade Institute. Please have a look at our 
at our website, www.cgai.ca. Um, have a listen to my podcast where I, like last week, I, I had a lady on that was, uh, she's the CEO of the Canadian Division of X Energy, uh, developing small modular reactors in Canada uh, from the large U.S. X Energy companies that have been financed by the State Department, the U.S. Department of Defense, the June of a billion and a half dollars to develop SMRs. You know, the SMRs are, in my view, you never got into it. I just mentioned nuclear, but SMRs are, can, can go a long way toward uh, uh, the necessity of, of, in fact, using existing grids to power cities. Like a small SMR, a 300 megawatt SMR, can, can power a couple hundred thousand homes. But these are these are things, going back to your folks at, uh, I, I, I suppose your roommates would be, are they deadly against nuclear power too? Because that's you know um, the, the, this is my I don't think you can you can do the future unless something else comes along and we haven't figured out yet. The, I, the environmental ethicist is against um, is against nuclear. The environmental scientists tend to be in favor. Uh, Interesting. <laughs> a waste of uh, it, Yes. Um, yeah, they, they've got complaints about waste. Um, you know, they're, uh, they're really into Godzilla, so you got to let them move on. I have one more, if, if you have time. Uh, Certainly. Uh, so, I was researching, uh, Dr. Baxter gave me uh, uh, some, some work to do, and a part of that was I ended up looking into nuclear, and I, I learned about thorium. Uh, thorium can be uh, turned into isotope uh, uranium-233, and you can have reactors running on it. Uh, when I checked thorium, Resources on a global map. The United States has more than almost anyone else. The only buddy, the only country that has more than us is India, and the other country that has the second, the, the next one over from there is Brazil. So I was looking at this map. It's all over the Midwest. It's all over Appalachia. Uh, I'm, I'm a, you know, I'm a Virginian. I've got family in West Virginia who would really like to see some of those mining jobs come back. Do you think that there's any potential to uh, develop that resource? Is everybody here familiar with the acronym Banana? Build absolutely nothing anywhere near anyone. Uh, unfortunately, I think that would be a problem. Oh man, it was like no one in the Midwest. It was like six people. <laughs> so my other bugbear is the giant and continuing to climb rural-urban divide, mm -hmm. and this speaks to your point. Uh, people that live in urban areas, and I'm not, you know, I live in an urban, big urban city. Uh, I don't think they, that a lot of the polity or those that are teaching them at the lower levels of education uh, under, to, totally understand where all the resources come from. And that's an issue, that's a very big issue going forward, in my own opinion, is a continued rural urban divide. It plays to politics and how people get elected, especially in this country and our country. Carry the cities, it's over. <laughs> Thank you so much, Kelly, for uh, for coming uh, here today. It's, uh, it was a pleasure. I thank uh, everybody for uh, being here. It's exciting to have a full room uh, after COVID uh, in person. Isn't it nice to be out doing things? Exactly. I also like to thank our uh, founder, Dr. Linchowski, and President uh, Ambassador Walsh to uh, joining us uh, in this event. It was uh, really a pleasure, and we're looking forward to having you back. Well, I look forward to it. Yes, I love DC. It's one of the it's one of the three or four great cities in the world. <laughs> and I'm not just saying that because I've been in some of them. Buenos Aires, really good. London, Rome, but this is a pretty great place. Thank you. Thank you.